Good morning, everyone. I'm Don Mortensen, associate pastor here. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I hope I get to do so soon. So if I don't meet you today, make sure you come back again. Then I can meet you next time. Can we get more lights up here? I'm getting old. I can't see unless I have lights. There we go. Thank you so very, very much. Well, we are in a series, Adam talked about, uh, Can You Drink the Cup? And this is the third week in the series, and today we're going to talk about lifting the cup. Last week, Adam talked about can you hold the cup, and he asked the question, can you hold the cup so that you can, oftentimes the cup of suffering, the cup of sorrow, the cup of pain, the cup of challenges, can you hold that till you get through that pain and, and you get to the joy that God has on the other side? That's the question. Today we're going to talk about lifting the cup. Throughout the Old Testament, let's take, and I thought we'd take a moment just to talk, maybe look a little more at the, what the Bible says about cups in general, about the cup. Throughout the Old Testament, the cup is often used as a symbol of God's judgment. For example, the Old Testament speaks of the cup of fury, the cup of judgment, a cup of trembling, the cup of isolation. Yet, the psalmist cries out, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. So the symbol of the cup, the symbol of the cup carries with it pictures of both wrath and redemption, judgment and blessing, and as Adam talked last week, sorrow and joy. Can we hold on to the cup and endure that through others around us, through prayer, through support, through God teaching us and helping us understand what we're going through till we get to the other side where there's joy. The night before uh, Jesus was crucified, he was eating uh, a meal with his disciples. It was a Passover meal, and uh, that was, we call that the Last Supper. That's oftentimes what it is referred to as. But he was celebrating the Passover meal, and he was celebrating in the context of community, right? He was with his disciples. He wasn't doing that alone. The Passover cup is one of the central symbols of the Passover meal. Yet the original Passover story makes no mention of whatsoever of a cup. In fact, the only biblical mention of a cup in connection with the Passover is in the New Testament, when we just talked about. When Jesus was celebrating his, this feast with his disciples, he raised the cup at least twice during the meal to make important statements about himself. So you remember the Passover story. The Israelites were in captivity in Egypt. Moses came with plagues and say, wanted Pharaoh to let his people go. Finally, the last plague was, if you don't let the people go, the firstborn of every human and, and uh, all livestock will die. But for the Israelites, God said, if you sacrifice a lamb and put blood on the doorpost, I will what? I will pass over you. And that's the celebration of, of uh, Passover. So the themes of judgment and salvation are woven together beautifully in the Passover story. God poured out his judgment on the Egyptians, but spared the Israelites who obeyed him by placing the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their homes. And each year, Jewish families retell these events through the Seder meal. That, the, that's the meal that commemorates uh, the Passover. Some of you during Easter time or during the Passover have celebrated. Some churches do that, have a Seder meal, which is basically the, the it's a meal that talks about the passage of the Jewish people from bondage into a time of freedom. Uh, we know that by the time Jesus was uh, uh, observed the Passover, drinking a cup during the meal was an official part of the observ- uh, observance. In fact, an ancient rabbinic source uh, instructs those celebrating to drink the cup four times during the Passover Seder. So the cup is lifted four times during that, that meal. And since the beginning of the church, and we're talking about the beginning of Acts, we read how the church began, it was customary for believers to eat together. It was an opportunity for fellowship and sharing with those who were less privileged. No doubt they finished the meal by offering the Lord's Supper, or taking communion together as we call it now. They call this meal the love feast, since its main purpose was showing love to each other or sharing with one another. Oftentimes, people who had means would come with a lot, of, uh, lot to eat uh, during this love feast. Many people would come who had little. And so, but they, together in community, they would eat this meal together, this love feast, and be able to share with one another in, in the context of community. <clears throat> 
The New, Testament's, uh, uh, the New Testament name is one of the cups. The cup taken after supper. We talked about four cups, remember? The cup taken after supper, which, which is traditionally the third cup in the Seder meal. Jesus calls this cup the new covenant in my blood, which is, shared, is shed for you. The Apostle Paul calls it the cup of blessing, which we bless. He talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So both Jesus and Paul draw on something from the Jewish tradition to provide insights not previously understood by calling the cup the new covenant in my blood. Jesus makes a direct reference to the promise in, in Jeremiah chapter 31. In that chapter, uh, the previous covenant talks about how the previous covenant had been broken, no longer, no longer uh, together. No longer, we, they had no longer uh, held that covenant together. But you would think if you break one of God's covenants, there would be a time, a cup of, of a terrible cup, a cup of disaster. But instead, God promised he'd bring a new cup, a covenant of grace and salvation. So when Jesus, the night before he dies, lifts up the cup, he says, this is the new covenant. I know I'm the new covenant. My blood is shed for you. And now you have a covenant of grace and salvation. Well then, as Adam talked last week, after the evening, after, the, after that Passover meal, uh, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Adam talked last week about this. Jesus cried out to the Lord in anguish. And he said, Father, it is your will. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In his humanity, Jesus wished that his cup, his cup of judgment, one that no one deserved except for, except for us. We deserve that cup of judgment. But Christ took it upon himself. Yet the obedience of God, Jesus... Uh, as the obedience of God, Jesus knew the cup of blessing could only be poured out for salvation of many if he would first drink the cup of God's judgment on all humanity. And that's what he did. So that's why Paul calls it the cup of blessing, which we bless. What greater blessing can there be than that which the Messiah purchased for us through his death, his burial, and resurrection? The cup embodies the problem of judgment as well as the promise of redemption. You know, it's reminiscent of another story in the Old Testament. Oftentimes, stories in the Old Testament are foreshadows of what's going to happen. Remember the story about Joseph? Joseph was, uh, if you ever watched The Coat of Many Colors, Joseph was thrown into a pit and sold into slavery by his brothers. And they left him for dead. Of course, we know through the story that he was, he's still alive. And he rose up, through, as you read this story in the end of uh, Genesis, he rose up to prominence in, uh, Egypt, in the Egyptian uh, culture. And so he was valued by the, by the Pharaoh. He was relied upon. And Pharaoh and uh, Joseph interpreted the dreams that Pharaoh had and said, there's going to be a famine. So he began to collect uh, grain for a long time and in, so they'd have grain during the famine. Well, Joseph's family traveled to Egypt so they could get some of his grain, and Joseph sees him. They didn't recognize him as their brother, but he recognized them. And he thought, you know, he, he, he couldn't, he, he just was so surprised to see them. But he said, I think you're spies. His youngest brother, the youngest brother in the family, wasn't there, Benjamin. He said, we're not spies. Said, Go back and get your brother. Bring him back to me. We can't do that. That'd be terrible. Our father would he wouldn't be able to survive. He said, like, I'm going to hold you in prison unless you bring your brother back. So they went, got the, brought, brought Benjamin back. And as they were leaving to go back with this grain to uh, their families, Joseph, what did he do? He took his silver cup, took his cup again, he hid it in Benjamin's sack. And when the Israelites came to look for it, they said, whoever we find has this cup, we put to death. And of course, the cup was in Benjamin's sack. And so here's a cup of judgment. And Joseph then reveals himself to his brothers and said, I'm Joseph, your brother. I'm the one you sold to slavery. But this cup of destruction, this cup of wrath, is now going to turn into a cup of blessing because you are going to come live with me. And we see that over and over again. The same cup that Jesus said, I will take this cup of desolation, I'll take this cup of wrath upon myself, and will turn into a cup of forgiveness. Uh, when we lift the communion cup, it represents our, our, as believers, our participation in Christ, in Christ's crucifixion. We're remembering Christ's body broken and his blood shed. 
And also, the more, more, very important along with that is what? We are celebrating the union of believers with one another. Communion symbolizes the unity of the believers and their, uh, and their love and concern for each other. We don't take communion individually. We take communion as a church. We take it on sun, the first Sunday of the month. Why? It's a time for us together in love to take this meal together. We're celebrating our community. We're celebrating the fact that Christ died for us and we are one, we are one together. We're all interconnected. The image of the body of Christ, as I said, talks about interconnectedness. And our Christian faith is not to be defined solely in terms of an individual relationship to God. Oftentimes, I've heard people say, I've been hurt by the church. The church has really been, it's been terrible to me. I, I can't go to the church anymore. Well, people, right? We hurt each other. We hurt each other a lot. But the church, the church is where Christ said, this is my body. I, I, I gave my life for the church. There's no such thing, and we read in the scripture, as an isolated, solitary Christian. We have been created in the image of God. Now, that's a, that's a complicated concept that we will understand, and many theologians have a hard time really understanding what it means. But we do know that we, in creating his image, we're created relational. We have relationships with each other. Why? Because God has been in an eternal relationship with the Son and the Holy Spirit. He's lived in perfect community from eternity. And so God is saying to us, you are, you are creating my image and you also live in community. You need to rely on each other. God could speak to each one of us individually, but he chooses to speak to us often through others. So let's say Tom is going through an extremely difficult time. Could God say, I'm going to take care of Tom? Yes, he could. God could take care of any of Tom's issues. But what does he choose to do? He chooses to say, I'm going to... I'm going to minister to Tom. I'm going to take care of Tom by bringing others around him. So we as a church, we as a community, come alongside Tom. We pray for him. We support him. We bring him meals to his home. We show him the love of God. That's how God chooses to minister. He uses us. He says, I'm the God of the universe, the greater God. I can do anything, yet I'm choosing to use you to accomplish what I want to accomplish. That's why uh, Meredith and, Ju and Julie and I are going to this conference. We want to learn to be trained. How do we train others to be able to walk alongside each other? That's what community does. That's what church is, that's what church is supposed to do. When you think about it, community really is like a mosaic, isn't it? Now, a lot of you may have mosaics in your home. You get pieces of sort of different size, different shape, different color. Individually, they may look quite insignificant. But together, when you have these master craftsmen put a mosaic together, they're gorgeous. So we're going to watch a short video. Imagine that each of these images going in is one of us in this church. God has said, I brought you together to create this beautiful mosaic, this church. And, and each of you, though you may seem insignificant individually, together you, you are a great mosaic. Let's show the video. Corporately, we create this beautiful image at the end. We are beautiful. I was hoping for a sunset or something, but I didn't find that. So all I could find was a horse. But you get the idea, right? The idea is that individually, those pieces don't represent a horse. When we get together, we do. Together, each of us is a piece of that, and we create this beautiful image of Jesus Christ. We together support, love, and encourage each other because we are a piece of what God has called. God has said, I've given each of you gifts, talents, and abilities. And each of these gifts are not for your benefit, they're for the benefit of each other. I want you to use these gifts and talents and abilities to support, encourage, and lift each other up. The cup of sorrow, the cup of joy, when lifted for others to see and celebrate, becomes a cup to life. And Adam talks about a cup of life. It's so easy for us to be truncated, to live truncated lives because of hard things that we experience. We often choose to keep our lives separate. We don't let other people know what's happening inside. We don't let them know our struggles. We don't know our fears, our secrets. We don't let them know the things we're struggling with. I've done this for years as a care person. I tell people all the time, you need to share what's going on in your life. Yet how do I live? I live very care. I, I choose not to tell people. Why? Because I, I'm, it's like most of us, individually, I'd rather handle it myself. But that's not what God asks. God says, don't live isolated lives. You are supposed to be opening your life, lifting your cup to each other, so we 
corporately can support and encourage each other. God's given us a new covenant in that life. Um, go to, yeah, Galatians 6 2. Most of us, we know that we want to fulfill the law of Christ. In Galatians 2, Paul says, bear each other's burdens. We're supposed to carry the burdens of each other. Why? Because that's how we fulfill the law of Christ. Not because it's just a good idea. Not because it'd be something we think we should do. Because, because it would make it nice. We do that because by doing that, we fulfill the law of Christ. Can you show the next slide? This is from Warren Wiersbe. Some of you have read some of his work. He is a theologian and a pastor. I love this quote. It says, It's impossible for a true believer to get closer to the Lord while at the same time be separate from fellow believers. How can we remember the Lord's death and not love one another? It's a great question, isn't it? And in 1 John chapter 4, it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. So that we're lifting our cup. We're seeing our cup that Adam talked about last week. We're embracing. We're holding the cup. We're holding the cup through our terrible times, through our trials, through our temptations. We're saying, can I hold this cup long enough so that I can see God's blessing on the other side? And now we're saying we live in community. We live in the context of a community that God has brought us together with. We need to lift our cup of, of sorrow we need to lift our cup of, of uh, challenges, of secrets, of pain, and say, I can't bear this by myself. We are fortunate in the fact that we have each other to rely on. As I've gone to the um, hospital over the years and talked to people, oftentimes they say, I can't imagine going through this without my church community. That's how God's designed us to work, to live, not as individuals, but as to, cope with it, to lift our cups our cups of pain, our cup of sorrow, hold on to them and lift them so that others can embrace us as well. Walk through it with us. Help us experience what it is God wants to experience. We will, be, we will find out on the other side, we will be more refined and more of who God wants us to be once we allow others into our life in the context community. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful not only that you love us, that you've designed us to live in community. I know that so often, at least for myself, I, I like to be independent. I like to be able to, to uh, lift up my, myself of my own bootstraps and be able to um, solve all my own problems. But Father, that isn't how you've designed us. You've lived in perfect community with the Son and the Holy Spirit and said that's how it's supposed to be. Do we hurt each other sometimes? Yeah, we hurt each other. But Father, you are the one who says, I'm choosing to use other people around you to support you, encourage you, and build you up. You must live in community. Father, that's why this Saturday, as Adam talked about, we're going to go through our community, not just our church community, but our neighborhood, and ask people, how can we pray for you? Why? Because they're part of our community. Because we love and we care for them and support them. We want them to know God loves them as well. Father, we're grateful for how you've created us and that we're grateful for this community you brought together. And we're so thankful for what you've done in Christ's name. Amen.